With us here today, obviously, is Louis Perez of Los Lobos. I'm going to guess that most of you know the history of Los Lobos. It's long career, uh, the multiple Grammys, um, but Louis is also a poet and a painter, and he has put together this amazing book, um, and I hope you all have a chance to get a copy and read it. Um, and here to talk with Louis today and to walk us through is Catalina Maria Johnson from WBEZ, and she's going to lead our discussion. So thank you both for being here. Thank Thanks for coming. Ok, Orale. vámonos, <laughs> vamos. It's a pleasure to be here and such a privilege um, to uh, lead this conversation, which will be punctuated by spontaneous readings uh, when the mood strikes and when the notion seems appropriate. But maybe just start with the obvious. Um, your lyrics have been described as painterly quite appropriately, and of course you do paint and you draw. So which happened first and how does mm. each art nurture, how is it nurtured the other over time? That's interesting. Well, uh, well, uh, growing up there was uh, always music in the house, okay, and, uh, and then you know, I, like, I started you know, with the crayon drawings stuck on the refrigerator door like you know, all the kids do. Uh, I was. I would say. Good. <laughs> I would say I was interested in in, in making things. Um, I I grew up without a father, so then and I didn't have the model that you know like, you know go out and do you know climb mountains or whatever and camping and all that sort of thing. So I became very cerebral, uh, and uh, I'd like to make things and I used to like draw and uh, there was a um, there was a show on TV that was a, 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 a guy by the name of Tom Hatton was a host and. He hosted a, a cartoon show as Popeye. And he did this thing where he had this um, um, big sheet of paper and used to draw Popeye and do all these squiggles. And so first thing I ever learned how to draw was Popeye. And I got so excited about drawing Popeye that I took a pad of paper and I, and I drew him over and over like about uh, 20 times. And I took him to school and I handed him out all to the, all the students. And of course, he just balled them up and threw them in the... On the all over the part, the school playground, and I got I, I was the one that got in trouble for it, but that was my earliest uh, uh, experience with uh, uh, art criticism. <laughs> now, were you already uh, singing and writing songs, or singing to yourself, or was music musical creation already a part of it then, when you were drawing Popeye? <laughs> The, the music, as I mentioned, growing up in East Los Angeles, it was always music. I lived in a real urban sort of setting. The, the, the bus stopped right in front of my house, and it was always. I lived across the street from a, the a public school that was on the corner, elementary school, and the, the elementary school that I went to, which was Our Lady of Guadalupe, it was a, um, a Catholic school. And there was the convent that was across the street. So I, I, I was raised by Columbian nuns, you know. <laughs> when, whenever uh, I'm, we'd, we'd leave the door, be pushed out of the, the screen door, it was their territory. So I was, you know, I belonged to them when, when I was out in the streets. So, so that was the thing. And the music was always around playing on the, the weekends, uh, backyard parties. It was always the smell of tortillas and, and, and Mexican food and, and the sounds of, of, uh, of Mexican music. And it was in the house as well. Wow. And what, but what we're seeing in this book then is the result, uh, two of the, the, two, the dual uh, trajectories of your life. Yeah, uh, it's true. Ha yeah, anyway. Have we, is there a point at which they are happening together and you, you see them nurturing or feeding each other or changing? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, when music started to happen, um, uh, I started playing in bands when I was in, a, in, in high school. I met the rest of the members of the band in high school. We were friends before we were musicians together. And, um, but before that, you know, there was, there was music, there was, there was art, there was always things. And then once I became, started writing songs, I drew from not only my experience of growing up in Los Angeles, but a way of, of translating that via visual art. So visual art, it always, the music always, the lyrics always come from the imagination, the imagining of actual, you know, visual characters, seeing people kind of walking across the room. In the book, there's actually an interview that talks about that process, about how that involves that, that thing. But, but at this point, 
and probably pretty early out, they became very intertwined. Wow, wow. So I know that uh, in the intro, we yeah, you describe yeah. the Los Angeles that, the, that is coming out. It of talks this. about is this that a good experience. Time? I'm going to read that for you. Um, so, this should, should I hold tricky, it? isn't it? Yeah, I think I'll hold the mic. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, no, you know, I think you can do it. I, no, I don't know what you have to do that. You know, I, I, have, I have to hire people to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, <laughs> so, I'm very inexpensive. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's okay. It's quite all right. Uh, I'm going to have to, um, you know, i got to put on the reading glasses. Getting old, you know what I mean? Yeah. If, I, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have bought more socks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Let me get the other glasses on. My son say that I make myself older than I am. But there's some things that I, we all realize that we can't deny. That lower back is one of them. Okay, <clears throat> let's see, here we go. <clears throat> it seems like it was just a day ago when I was riding on my Schwinn Stingray bike around the streets of my busy neighborhood in East Los Angeles. Singing along to the songs playing on the red plastic transistor radio that was taped to the handlebars. Looking back, there were two radios playing in my young life. There was a brown bake-like zenith on the counter by the blender of my mom's kitchen that she had permanently tuned to one Spanish language station. I woke up early in the morning to the sound of rancheras, as many other radios did through Mexican Los Angeles. The radio serenaded my mom as she toasted French bread on an iron comal and made coffee in a dented percolator. Then there was the other radio, the one that was attached to my blue bicycle that was about the size of the pack of camels my uncle Manuel smoked as he lay on the old green army cot in a tiny back room of my abuelita's house. That radio cranked out the sounds of the miracles, the Four Tops, the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, as well as some not so old oldies at the time. Music was all around me in my neighborhood. There was everything from the car stereos blasting rhythm and blues out of midnight blue low riding Chevy and Palos to the sweet angelic sounds of the choir rehearsing in the church hall across the street. It soon became clear in my mind that music was something special. In the beginning, I never imagined music would become that big of a part of my life and who I am. What started as a spark turned into full-blown fire. It changed my perspective, the way I looked at what surrounded me. The gritty reality I saw in my Isabel Barrio became poetic and beautiful. The dreams that sometimes dissolve into bitterness and rage, there was poetry. In the small, shrouded, lavender sunsets along the horizon of downtown Los Angeles, I saw a thing of beauty. I heard the music of joy and promise as I rode my bike past a house where a newborn baby was crying. Page break. <clears throat> I saw the look of hope and wonder on faces as children walked on their first day of school. Not long after that, in high school in 1973, Cesar Rosas, David Hidalgo, Conrad Lozano, and myself formed Los Lobos. The band subsequently took me to, from my little neighborhood to every corner of the United States and to countries all around the world. For all these many years, I've been writing songs, making music, and when I find time for my crazy schedule, I, I draw squiggly lines on a piece of paper and make paintings. As I reflect now, it's been quite a journey on my, that blue bike. And what I have to show for it is this little collection of writings, poems, and pictures to serve as a reminder of where I've been, what I've seen, and the dreams I think we've all had. Now I've gathered a selection of these songs and art and put them in some kind of order, the way a young boy on the brink of adolescence might gather up his toys and the evidence of his youth and try to make sense out of what those things mean. So I'm happy to share this all with you, and I hope you enjoy the ride as much as I did. Wow. wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a concept. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. like a rock show, all right. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you so much. That was pretty good. Yeah. I that... think I got back, okay? Yeah, all right. yeah. All right. So uh, that was it. That was kind of the, the, the whole thing of me growing up and how I got inspired to uh, play music. Wow. And, and to, well, I always was making stuff and drawing pictures before that. Wow. 
And so, so we come to this book, and it is uh, described as a memoir. But yeah, that but came the, after. I didn't even think about <laughs> the, it that way. Because because the, the chapters they're fascinating to me. The eight, mm -hmm. There's eight chapters and one on uh, essays by colleagues and friends. Right. So the eight the titles of the chapters and the organization. I'm curious about how that came together. I'm something like joy. Mm. Number two, lost souls and haunted hearts. Number three, something called love. Four, good morning, Astlan. Mm. Five journeys. Six, truth and passion. Seven, dreaming about green shoes, haircuts, and cake. Eight, big questions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is, is there a chronology? Is there a... Yeah. What, what's... Well, we, what we started with, we had this idea that we were going to... Um, we started with 240 song lyrics. Uh, that's how, how many songs I've written, I guess. Wow. Um, and we whittled it down. We started picking songs. Actually, we started like subtracting. We kind of did a kind of a razor thing where we, I, songs that I felt really strongly about, and, and we kept you know, whittling them down, whittling them down. We finally ended up with a hundred songs. So once we had a hundred songs, and we did, we went went about the, the the business of trying to put them in some kind of order. So somehow we got them together like by these chapters, which are by themes, and that's what those themes are. So it's one, like you said, there's uh, the first chapter is um, something called joy, and, uh, and there's songs that, dare I say it, are happy songs. It's hard, you know, it's, it's much easier to write a sad song, I guess that's what it is. They all say that. And lost souls and haunted hearts, boy, that's, that's not actually, a, you know, like a horror movie chapter, but it's actually, <laughs> actually about uh, things that, um, that are a little gritty and a little more um, uh, about uh, things that are a little tough, you know, um, in, in our lives. Everything that I've, always, always, I've, I've written has always come from back to where I, the experiences I grew up, you know, I couldn't write about Brentwood or, or, or Beverly Hills, you know. <laughs> I'd, I'd write about East LA and all the experiences that I had there. So uh, the chapters uh, kind of fell together in, in that kind of order, just putting them in different themes and, and um, trying to make order of it, because really, essentially what this is, uh, we all have a, a, a shoebox under the bed, right, where, where we keep stuff that we can't get ourselves to throw away, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so um, I took all those things that I had under my bed in a shoebox and I dumped them in this book. So that's basically what I did. And we had to come up with some kind of order, so that was the order we came up with. <laughs> um, wh one thing that struck me as I, as I looked through the chapters and as I was the use of the word some, something, mm. something like joy, something called love, somewhere, yeah, sometime. Yeah. Mm. All kind of hopeful, but but not, but abstract still. So I'm, I'm curious about that, yeah. that I, word. I, I think that uh, the generalities, I guess, about it, and, and, and something like joy, because uh, there isn't anything really specific about anything. I think it's all subjective in a way. That that the things that make us happy are, are, are usually kind of relative to like what's going on mm -hmm. in our lives and the lives of the immigrants and the lives of people who work very regular jobs and the lives of like a you know musician that's on the road 150 times out of the year. So uh, that's what, like, see, for instance, joy is just one of those things that's kind of relative to, to, to things. So it's, okay, there's something like it. There's something like love, you know? Do we really know what that is? You know? <laughs> what we like when it happens, right? <laughs> Somewhere and sometime. Yeah, yeah it sure is. Uh -huh. So um, along the way, I know this is a little bit like saying, which of your children do you love the most? But <laughs> is, is there a song that you... Uh, feel and and or perhaps one that you'd want to read that 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 really came close to something something like perfect. <laughs> oh wow! Well, you, yeah, you you caught me on surprise on that one, but I know the answer to it. Okay. The one that that really kind of means a lot to me that was um, that happened. It was on a record called Kiko that came out in 1992. I don't know. Yeah, 92. I think so. <clears throat> and that song was Saint Behind the Glass, which was. Mm -hmm. uh, a mm. uh, story about, uh, um, let's see, I think it's really early. It's very so. early. Yeah. <clears throat> now i got to find it. Oh, here it is. I got it. 
Uh, this is a lyric, of course, and something that, that I, I've always wondered about, whether uh, song lyrics, are, is that poetry? Yeah, well, you know, because it doesn't rhyme, maybe it's not, because it rhymes, maybe it's not poetry, but I don't know. So, I, you know, I, I, once I put this on here, I realized, you know, this is kind of like poetry, oh, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, and I think there is, uh, there's something to it, but the same behind the glass is a song that is, uh, that I wrote, which was about, um, on the, in the home of every Mexican-American home or Mexicano home, there's a, a dresser top altar where there's a, usually the centerpiece is a saint that the family has a particular um, uh, devotion to. And uh, my house was not like, uh, unlike uh, other houses, we had uh, that dresser top altar. And in the middle of, of that altar was, a, uh, I think it was a Santo Nio de Atocha, which was in, a, in this case that had these glass sides and it was, it had a door to it, and it was inside. I often asked my my mom when I was real small, "Why is it in? Why is that saint inside that 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 case?" And my mom looked at me and said, uh, "So it won't run away." <laughs> and he's talking about ambiguous. I mean, you know, it's a, you know, that kept me up night a few times. You know, I have to admit. Uh, but uh, so I took the perspective of uh, of of. Um, of that saint, of, of what, what it sees, me, and, and what I see in that room. So I'll, I'll read that to you. <clears throat> and it's uh, uh, a comment on, on the song, is the sights and smells of um, my childhood home in, on Hamill Street in East Los Angeles. Hammer and a nail, hammer and a nail. Saint behind the glass holds a hammer and a nail. Baby in his arms, Baby in his arms, same behind the glass, has a baby in his arms. Watches me sleep, watches me sleep, same behind the glass, watches me while I sleep. Coffee in the air, yeah, it's a coffee in the air. Same behind the glass, smells coffee in the air. Curtains blowing around, curtains blowing around, same behind the glass, sees curtains blowing around. Night upon my head, night upon my head, same behind the glass lays night upon my head. Mother don't cry, mother don't cry, same behind the glass tells mother not to cry. That's it. Wow. <laughs> kind of messes me up. Yeah, that's a... And it's a very powerful song. It's one of those that just very heart. It, people, you know, breaking. what's interesting is that that's that's what's very cool about the the our humanness is that um, this is very specific. It's very something incredibly uh, specific about my life and the things that I experience, almost in a tactile sort of kind of uh, way. But it's become a song that people all over kind of graduate, you know, they, they, they gravitate toward that song in particular. Right, Sandy? I mean, you were telling me how, uh, uh, what did you say, that you used to sing that song to your kids or play it for them when they were kids, right? Sandy, Webb, uh, Sandy and Paul I've known for a long time, you know, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, yeah, right. And, and so it, it's become kind of special to people. So there's something about, Taking something that is direct from your experience and what's emotion, moved by your personal emotions can actually translate into other people's lives. And that's what's, what, what I took on as a job when I was a songwriter, because I figured, well, um, my baby loves me or she doesn't love me and you know, all this. <laughs> you know, that, well, I'm not putting that down, but I mean, I, I wanted to write in a way about my experience and how it relates to other people. So I wrote it in a universal way so that if I'm talking about the wrong side of the tracks, it could be in East Los Angeles, it could be in, in um, the, the Kansas City, Kansas, it could be anywhere so that where people can kind of relate to the certain things, you know, and that's what I set out to do. And, and um, I hope I've, I've kind of accomplished that. And sometimes I do, I, sometimes I run into, People who will say, this particular song meant a lot to me in my life, or this song, you know, was something that, that got me through a tough time. 
And if, if, if only you hear that twice, you know, I've kind of already done, done what I set out to do. Wow, yeah. Well, I was just thinking also when you talked about how universal some songs have become, it's a matter of time has become kind of, uh, because it says, you know, it's a matter of time, I'll, I'll come back and get you or I'll send for you, you know, it's just a matter of time. How that's become kind of an immigrant anthem almost. That's right. around that's right. Much beyond the yeah. Mexican-American experience. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, when we made our first record in 1983, um, I mean, the first record that legitimized us, you know, it was like a, on a real record label, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, it was seven songs, and it was a couple of Richie Valens songs, a couple of Tex-Mex songs, and a couple of songs that we had written. When, when, uh, when that did really well, and, and, we, and it came time to write the full-length record, um, there was a couple ways I could have gone as a songwriter. I could have been, I could have gone this way. The band could have been like a good time, great to dance to kind of band, mm -hmm. or it could be go the other way where I was writing songs about things that really mean something to me and hopefully would mean something to, to someone else. So that's the direction I took. So songs like like um, "Seen Behind the Glass," yeah, certainly, and and on a more topical sort of thing about immigration, there was a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Which and and the root to Gila Bend and other things, the valley, a song about the valley, which is about the the food that we put on the table, that is the you know the product of human hands that are, are worked in the fields, <clears throat> that sort of thing. So uh, those things became really important to me, and so um, uh, to get that that across, but not in a way that it kind of hits them overhead with the picket sign either. Yeah, yeah not preachy. Mm. Um, so. I think we're going to open it up to questions pretty shortly because I know that people will definitely want to to, yeah. uh, to ask more specific questions. But um, before we do that, would you read something else? Something for us? You, you, you pick one. We, we we chose a whole bunch of stuff here, but yeah, I, I know. Say, like, oh, well, and you picked I, the first one that I didn't even mark, so it's cool. So let's just <laughs> let's just do whatever. Well, uh, what would you like to hear? Well, one last question before I'm curious about the association of image. And word. Oh yeah, there's no, there's no uh, uh, rhyme or reason to any of these. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. I, what I did was that that uh, I, uh, I explained to you. That I had this uh, uh, these plastic tubs full of drawings and stuff that go all the way back to like the 70s. Uh -huh. um, I certainly, I don't have any of the Popeye ones left. <clears throat> um, and I gave them to a friend of mine who actually curated the images in this book. His name is Rodolfo Arana uh, Lopez, who lives in, he's a, in Tijuana, actually. It was his idea for this book. And I gave him all the stuff, and I said, you pick. Because if you leave it up to me, it'll be 20 years before this book comes out. You, you know what? I mean, we all relate to that. You have to choose. I, don't, I can't make decisions. I don't know. And I get older. I don't know. I guess. Uh, so um, he chose all the images, and they don't really relate to each other. Sometimes they, they just happen to. Uh -huh. And then, uh, but they're just, uh, I just said, pick them out, and then. We just started putting them together. And, and then you wrote some comments always to introduce. Yeah, there's a, a comment before e each mm -hmm. lyric. Uh, at first, my, my editor, Luis Torres, said, well, why don't you uh, write a, 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 a comment saying, you know, talking about what, how you, the songs came together and where were you in the back seat of a Chevy Impala? <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> what were you doing? And I thought that would get a little bit tedious. Uh -huh. so, I, so I just did like these one line comments about something, however I felt about the song, and, and that was it. So that kind of, the only thing that I did to illustrate it, the rest of it is just a song itself. Wow, wow. Um, well, before we, why ask, so I get to pick? <laughs> is that, was that? Yeah. I, I picked. Uh, but before we, I just want to. Uh, I, I tell you what, can we do, I'll do, I'll do one that I want, and okay. you do one that you want. Okay. You and start. We, <laughs> okay, um, but I do also want to mention so that we don't forget that there's another edition of the oh, book coming yeah, out with yeah. music. We want to talk about that. Yeah, okay. talk about that, um, please, before so we, so so we this, don't forget. This is a, there's a hundred songs in here, and there's uh, some little bitty micro stories. I'll read one of those in a second, and we'll, we'll move this along. And, but okay, so there's all these songs, but what's missing? The music, right? Okay, so <clears throat> what we did, um, a friend of mine, uh, uh, he produced it. Uh, we, do, we did a companion audio CD. I mean, it's, it's such a thing anymore. Uh, but it's, a, a, it's, a, it's incredible. It's 50 performances of, um, half of them are songs that were 
uh, that friends did. It, it, sometimes it's simple as just playing them with an acoustic guitar uh, on their cell phones. And some, some friends who couldn't help themselves actually went to the studio and, and, and <laughs> messed around with it. And, uh, and there's uh, that many, at least uh, 20 uh, to 25 readings from a lot of friends of mine, some of them who are, who are actual actresses, actors, uh, some of them that are poets. Um, and there was even a friend of mine who, uh, who lives in, um, in Birmingham, Alabama, who has this incredible accent that I just had to use her somewhere. So it's kind of all over the place. And then there's, uh, um, uh, for all you bibliophiles I like to read, uh, uh, George Saunders, who had the big book, uh, Lincoln of the Bardo, uh, uh, last year, he, he read one. So it's kind of all over the place. And um, it's all introduced by this uh, English uh, friend of mine who's a barrister, and, he, and there's this introduction that he reads himself, and he actually reads the credits at the end. But it's 156, no, I, just short of two hours long. It's on two discs or how many minutes. So that's going to be available uh, uh, on the 15th um, by pre-order right now. And um, there's 150 copies right now that are going to be available for the holidays, and then after the first of the year, there's going to be more, and this will be a special edition that's going to be signed, and and there's be a, a um, CD like tipped in the back, and this is kind of a crazy idea. There would be a an original drawing that'll be in each one, so that's kind of nuts. So I could better get to work. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, that, and, and then, of course, the, the, the first and foremost and most important thing is all the proceeds to this book, audio and the special edition, is all going to, uh, to a charity. It's going to um, Luis Rodriguez, who's a publishing house here, uh, Tia Chucha Press. He has a cultural center in Silmar, California, where there's a, a half a million uh, Latinos there with almost no services at all. There's no, no, no support for them. Uh, uh, culturally, except for Tia Chucha's bookstore and cultural center. So all the proceeds go to them to help them develop programs and all that. Because uh, it's interesting, that another thing that goes, go, happens when you get older, um, I'm starting to think that I want to go to heaven now. <laughs> so, um, but, but, you know, <laughs> but, you know, with my luck, you know, I'll be using the GPS and right when I get there, it'll see rerouting, rerouting, you know. <laughs> So I don't know, but uh, go ahead. I'm getting I'm no, too no, long winded on that. Go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, so my pick is in 1964. Oh yeah, okay. Which is that, that, on page okay. 114. Yeah, we'll, which yeah let's. Just, I love. Where is that one? I don't know. Oh, There's no one, index. Oh, That'll be the next the page, next edition. 114. 114. Yeah. Okay. 114. There it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, you know that I, that's something you do have to say in, in advance. Uh, the very first line references the Sears Tower. It's not the one here, because it's called something else now, isn't it? Yeah. Willis. Okay, yeah. Well, there was a Sears Tower on Soto and, and, and uh, Olympic Boulevard, uh, this huge thing with this green neon around it. Okay. <clears throat> Let me take a sip real quick. <sighs> Somebody put water in my vodka. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, in 1964, you could see the Sears Tower on Olympic Boulevard from anywhere in East LA. It stood guardian-like over rivers of concrete that pointed eastward toward Boyle Heights and the then green hills of City Terrace. Crayola-colored stucco houses where Mexicanos took their residence long ago ran up those hills. Behind flapping screen doors, a million moms rolled butter tortillas and gave Kool-Aid to their kids as they ran out the door to play in the dust. We chase watermelon trucks in the summertime or ro ride the current bus for a dime to the Chicano Miracle Mile, Whittier Boulevard, to watch the movies at the Boulevard Theater. We saw the Three Stooges in orbit there. On the screen, Mo hit Larry, and in the lobby, Lencho hit Rudy, and we all ran out to squint in the sun. We lie on, convertible, um, <laughs> excuse me, we lie on the convertible sofa on hot nights with the door wide open to catch a breeze and hear Dad's stories about the war, monsters, and Uncle Manuel's operation to remove, to remove a splinter that grew to the size of a small tree. Every Mother's Day, he'd buy Mom these sweaters as she'd re, that she'd rewrap and put away just to keep wearing the tattered orange one she wore on her migration from Colorado to LA in 1922. 
My grandma Kuka didn't speak any English, so she'd sit in front of the TV with the sound turned down and make up her own plots. Her best friend was a guy called Gunsmoke. <laughs> Life never seemed or want to change in the little white house on Hamill Street. With this decorative iron and mosaic of plant pots sitting on the porch rails. There was always this thing about East LA, born of the earth and risen up not unlike the San Gabriel Mountains we'd see occasionally when the wind blew the smog through the valley, surrounding us in the mystery of who we were and where we've come from. It was something that we couldn't see, but we could feel, something that we couldn't hear, but resonated in our bones. And in the roses and rosaries and damp smell of beans boiling, a sad, happy forever spun around us and held us to its breast. So click your heels all you want, Dolores. You can never go home. But sometimes you can strip it away, make it all go away. In that only free place of paled memory, in the oneness of space and time, we tumble through the universe back into those warm, sweated arms again. And it's then we can all go home. <clears throat> And there has to be a large print edition. <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah. Okay. Uh, I love that one for so many reasons. Um, one of them is, is the colors, that, and that's when I started really thinking of your use of color in, in, in songs, besides Kiko and the Lavender Moon. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, here, you know, it's, there's Crayola, there's green, there's orange, there's yeah. White House, there's... No. A very sensory experience, but definitely so much use of color. So wow. a beautiful okay. thing. <laughs> um, I wish I could say I meant to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. Yeah. So, uh, so your pick. Oh so, yeah. Okay. There, there's. Um, um, where is it? This is one's just kind of fun. There was a couple of heavy ones, so I think I'll stay away from those. Rudy's party. That's a little kid's birthday party. <clears throat> There was roses growing in the patch by the screen door. On the pink steps, potted spearmint fixed our stomachs when too much cake and jello kept us up at night. Little Rudy's party went on and on, even after Rudy fell asleep, tired from running circles in the brown grass, too excited about anything, not knowing or caring about turning five. I guess everything looks so big when you're that small. Huge, 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 huge shoes coming through the house singing, Déjame morir. Uncle Pancho whistled and Tio Bendy wore that dumb looking straw hat and always put cowboy boots when he got drunk. Sunk bad in our faces when he said, ay que chulo. <laughs> Uncle Pancho whistled and Tio Bendy wore that dumb, dumb looking straw hat and always put on big cowboy boots when he got drunk. And oh yeah, Manu could fly, or at least he said he could, when only when the moon was full and more like when his belly was full of cough medicine and beer. The hot dogs and bread tasted good, but the beans had fat chunks of onion that made me sneeze. My grandma liked them that way with a big orange soda on the side, so I made a plate for her because she can't come out no more. Some presents were wrapped in the Sunday funny papers, some wrapped in the white butcher stuff you get at Carvajal's Dandy Market, but Rudy won't be opening them up today. He's too sleepy and too tired. I'll bet he'll be up early tomorrow before the pots line up at the corner for soup and eyes are too red to get out of bed. Everybody got silly and somebody got very stupid that long day, but the sky forgave and the clouds moved away, making it all right. Happy birthday to you, the rooster cried. Happy birthday to you, for you, the bird sang up in the trees. And have a nice life, all the neighbors shouted. And for miles around, car horns honked and lunch wagons tooted their goofy songs. And the church bell rang five times for Rudy and one time for good luck. <laughs> Large <print. clears throat> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, now it's time for some questions. Iron size, you want to do iron size? Yeah, yeah. iron size? OK. I won't no, say no. no. Really? No. I think we've, we've okay. gone long enough. OK. I think so? Okay. Okay. I love Ironsides. Okay. Okay. Ironsides. <laughs> <laughs> what page is that one on? Uh, let me find. Oh, it's on uh, 92. And 92. And it's not that long. Uh, this more. is from a record that was called Latin Playboys that David and I, Mitchell Froome, and Chad Blake did. Uh, and this is a song that, that uh, was actually kind of spoken over the 
kind of spoken word over, uh, over music. What, what 92. 92, okay. This is a, this is a little piece about... Um, it's got the cat. 92, okay. About um, no. going to the drive-in movies. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, that was italics, go, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> pues vamos entonces, let's take iron sights. Ay, Papa, do we have to take the truck? Why not, mija? You can sit in the back and watch the movie. What if it gets cold? Come on, put on a jacket and hurry up. Mom, can we take Lily's silica? We can all fit. Look, mija, that's your padre, and he likes to do stuff like that. But, Ma, I don't, especially when he drops me off at school. It's embarrassing. I could go to school with Lily, or, she could, or I could always walk. It's not that far. Right, Rudy? Get off date. Dad's case, Moko. He's Ruko. What do you want? Don't call me that stupid. I'm just saying, I am now announcing that Ironsides is ready for boarding for the trip to the movie show starring Ricardo Montalvan and Samueras. <laughs> we squeezed into the cab, picked up Mama Lisa, stopped by to get some sodas, and drove off to the show. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's like a movie, I guess. Huh? I, I love They're that. Different characters. Yeah, it, the I just the story. Just Do you remember doing that? Um, going to the driving yeah, movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a. You dress you up in it was a station way. <laughs> it was, and there were these little speaker things. And do you oh, remember yeah. that? Yeah. And then you could I, get the, 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 go to the concession stand. Well, I had a lot of friends that drove away with those. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah, it's connected to it. Okay, all right. All right. Um, I know we're going to be doing some signing, but I think there's a little yeah, bit of time for some yeah, questions. Yeah, good time. And Carrie's got the mic. How are we doing for time, Carrie? Okay. Hey, thank you very much, and would have loved to hear you sing a couple of those, but anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I teach uh, in the business program at Illinois Institute of Technology, and for some reason this semester, I had eight students who were interested in careers in music, ah. business majors, weird. So you know, one of the things I'd be interested in a little bit more because I've talked to them is your experience of actually starting that band in high school. What was that like? You know, how, you said you had, they were high school friends, but tell us a little bit more, give us a little color on that process. I'd okay, be really I'll, curious I'll try to on not that. be so verbose. Um, <laughs> uh, we, uh, I'm sure it's a story. Uh, we were friends in high school, uh, and uh, we all were, were musicians, but we didn't play in the same band together. So when we graduated from, from, uh, from high school, we were just friends, and we used to hang out during the day, and. And, uh, and we'd see each other's uh, uh, bands whenever. If I wasn't playing, I'd go see Conrad's band. He had this three-piece power trio, you know, louder than anything else kind of thing. And we'd go see Caesar, and Caesar had a band that was kind of like a uh, big soul band. And Dave and I were kind of satisfied with just being backyard parties. And But eventually, because we were just all hanging out together, and we're musicians, you know, well, I guess what they say is that if you hang out around at a barbershop, you'll eventually get a haircut. <laughs> So we started a band, and uh, and we just uh, we started the band to play Mexican music, which was unusual for teenagers. Uh, but we had just kind of on a lark. We wanted to play a song for Mañanitas, which is a serenade to your to your mom or, or whoever on their birthdays. So we went out to set out to learn one of these songs, and we realized how challenging it was. We didn't realize that that because uh, yeah, they always played in the background, Mexican music always in the background. But we were like rock and roll kids, right? We, we were convinced that, that rock and roll was the number one thing in the world, you know, that, that's, where every, that's the holy grail. But no, there was all these musicians that played this fantastic stuff in these Mexican uh, folkloric songs. So we learned those, and then, and then we went on for 10 years doing that, and then we, we uh, went back to electric, and then we crossed the LA River to play in these punk rock clubs, and, and then somebody heard us and signed a, a deal, and, and off we went to find America in a, in a, a 83 Dodge van. And uh, no, it was older than that. It was, it, it was all beat up. Does anybody, do you remember that van? Who was out, out there during that time? They uh, uh, probably pushed it. Uh, but that was it. That was it in a nutshell. That's how it all, it all started. Uh, um, we were the accidental rock stars, for sure. Because we never, never set out to, 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 uh, to do anything like this. Uh, everything was, uh, was a gift. 
everything just came from somewhere else and, and certainly from a lot of hard work. Louis, thank you. I would You're argue welcome. you are the greatest American rock and roll band. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's nice. Thank you. Um, and everything else that you guys play. But I, I'm curious, your process with your songwriting with David, mm -hmm. you, do, you guys write a lot yeah, of right, songs together. Right. And, He's my writing partner for right. film of 50 years now. If you could just expand on that process. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? If you could expand oh, okay, on that okay. process. Uh, uh, we're songwriters. Ideally, we'd both sit down in a, in a room with a pencil and paper and a guitar and write a song. And that went on for, for probably the first record, Will Will Survive, uh, Matter of Time, all that's, those songs are written that way. Um, but as life gets complicated and time is a premium, we start splitting it up a little bit. He'd come up with a musical uh, idea and I'd, I'd be the, come up with a lyrical idea. Sometimes he would cross collateralize, but we pretty much were doing that that way. And, but to, to say that he was just a musical component and that to say I was just a lyricist would be discounting us because we're songwriters. Because eventually, when we finish doing our jobs, we put it together, we go to the, to the studio, and, and we kind of have it fleshed out, and then we show it to the rest of the band, and then we tell them that you better do this or else. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's pretty much the process. Thank you for asking. Hi, thank you. I had a question. Um, as a, a lyric that kept getting played as a song, did you, was there ever a lyric that kept changing every time the song was played? When every time it, it was played or was, while it was being written? As, as the song was actually played, as, as you kind of kept getting different ideas for it or maybe you weren't quite, didn't quite finished in some ways, and mm. so that it slightly got revised as the actual performance happened? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, well, musically, we never play the song the same way twice. You know, we're we're not one like like Beyonce, who has everything rehearsed and every note is ex exact and very precise. And there's there's a place for that, but but not where we come. <laughs> not what we do. Uh, but lyrically, it doesn't really uh, change except when David forgets the lyric, <laughs> uh, and and then 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 you hear some repetitions there. Yeah. <laughs> But in writing the songs, you know, it, uh, sometimes it'll come from conversation, all the ways from conversation. I hear something and I'll write something down and it might be just you and I talking. And I said, wow, you know, I had a conversation with a friend and, he, and he was, we were talking about finances and, he said, and I said, I keep my, my finances in a, in a coffee can under my bed. I was just making a joke, this is my tin can trust. And then he said, wow. <laughs> and, then, and so I wrote a song and became the title track to the next record. I, so I, I didn't pay him any royalties, so. Uh, so it, it, things, it, things of that inspired, and then in the process of actually writing a song, I'll start one place, and then, then I'll end up like going somewhere else, you know. The, um, and it's, uh, it, 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 I, I just let it, the, the, best, the best time when you're writing something, and it goes for any type of writing, I think, is when, when time kind of evaporates and you, it just doesn't exist, and you're in that zone inside that thing, and, and it's a great place to be. And then when you're all done, you struggle to get out of it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's the way it happens with me. It, it changes a little bit. Thank you both. This has been wonderful. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, thank you, Maria. <laughs> um, are you thinking of doing th some things for kids, like maybe converting some of these stories into like that, that birthday Rudy thing would be oh. perfect in a children's book? Oh, yeah, and I know yeah, you've yeah. done the, the Papa's Dream CD a long time ago, Los Lobos did. That was, uh, there seems like there should be a, so much uh, material that you could, you know, focus Yeah, kids. we really would like to. We, we've done a couple things. We did a, a, a record called uh, Papa's Dream, which was a, a collection of traditional songs, but it was focused for children. And it was all uh, uh, told by Lalo Guerrero, which was, uh, uh, he passed away, but he was um, uh, one of the godfathers of uh, Chicano music, starting back in the, in, the, in the 40s. And that was specifically for, for, uh, for kids. We, we actually were on, on, um, uh, we're on uh, Sesame Street. We got a lot of mileage on that one. We did uh, uh, Elmo and the Lavender Moon. <laughs> Is that a key going? That was really a really very, very cool kind of thing. And, uh, so we've done some things like that, but, but I would like to do something that, 
might be like you say with Rudy's party, or maybe one of the, the songs and kind of do a more protracted, protracted version of, of maybe a children's kind of thing. We haven't wrote the quintessential, uh, I mean, the, the very dedicated, specific uh, children's record yet, but we'd like to. It's like the perfect song that, that Yeah, yeah, right yeah. Yeah, that, that, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> okay, okay, that'll, we'll do it. We'll, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks. Excuse me. Um, I'm interested in the creative process, mm -hmm. though. What comes first, the song, the music, and then the lyrics, or the lyrics, and then the music? I... Mm, that, yeah. Um, again, because we, 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 we divide our time now, and we, then we put it all together. Um, a lot of times I'll get a, a, a piece of music from David, and, and then I, I'm not saying I'm anything special, but I kind of hear some, something. And sometimes even if he does a, a, a scratch vocal, which means that he just kind of hums a melody, sometimes, you know, sometimes he, he'll hum something that almost kind of sounds like a word. And uh, uh, for example, there's a song called Good Morning Aslan. We, we are, we're done with the record, we're ready, to, you know, we hadn't had a title for it and anything. And then David came back to the studio and said, I've got a, a, another piece of music, I want to hear it. And I listened to it and I said, wow, that's cool. Then when it was starting to flesh it out in the studio, I actually, the title just said, wow, Good Morning Aslan. And, and then from there, it, I was off and running. Because Good Morning Aslan, is, and if you read the lyric, it's the day in the life of East Los Angeles, uh, my neighborhood. And, and it's like the morning when you get up and there's mom with a stack of dishes, everything's kind of a little exaggerated and there's dads honking the horn in front to get the kids to school. And, and it goes all through that, through the whole, the whole song, just describing the morning in East LA, trying to get the, their, their lives going. So, so that, that that's kind of just happens that way. It just comes together. Um, they kind of complement each other, obviously, and they try to write, write lyrics that I can believe that David will sing. So all those things come into play. I'm curious, does everybody know the, the origins of Aztlan? Is that familiar? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I, or just that Aztlan, yeah, yeah. The, the place itself, yeah. the mythical place itself, yeah, um, and why that Good Morning Aztlan in the United States would, right, right. would be and, so and meaningful. Yeah, it's A-Z-T-L, apostrophe A-L-N, Aztlan. I remember Brian Williams said, Aztlan, once when he introduced us somewhere. Um, but uh, Aztlan is, is the mythological uh, a birthplace, ancestral home of of, uh, of our indigenous, uh, uh, you know, maybe Azteca, Maya, all the different indigenous, and it's a place in the north, which is supposed to be located somewhere around the southwest. Am I correct? Correct. correct. You yeah. want to take it from there? Well, I, I, uh, I it's just it, nobody knows where it is, but there's the search. There's always been this idea that someday. Uh, we'd make it back to Aztlan mm -hmm. and find it, find Aztlan. Yeah. And so, during, the, so. And during the, the, the Chicano movement, they, they identified the, the Southwest where most of the movement of, uh, of students and, and uh, the, you know, in the late 60s uh, came out of, uh, of the barrios in East LA and some places, you know, to a lot of the other places through the Southwest. And they called this Aztlan and, and, and that's what, that, because it goes all the way back to our, our ancestry. Right, and it's got that ZT, which means it comes from Nahuatl, which oh, yeah. is that's the original a, indigenous point. language. Yeah. So, Aztlan. That's so a Nahuatl, hard to which is indigenous language of, uh, of the uh, Aztecas. <laughs> right. Back. Hi, thanks for doing this. It's been just tremendous. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Where are you? Yeah, back oh, yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering uh, what some of your influences were. You don't have to talk louder. It's just I'm hard of hearing. Oh, okay. <laughs> what some of your influences were both uh, poetry and prose oh. when you were growing up, uh, things okay. that really lit your fire when you were younger. It's specifically on, on, on lyrical stuff or music uh, in general? Knowledge, well. I don't no, know. I'm still looking for that. Novels? Huh? Novels or poems? No, oh, novels, okay. I thought he said knowledge. Poetry? Wow. I'm still waiting poet? for the wisdom part to show up. What, what's that? Oh, a poet or a Oh, poem? yeah, of course. Um, I, I, I grew up reading a lot. Uh, I'd walk down to the, the, the uh, library in East Los Angeles, which was walking distance from my house. And there was books around the house that my dad left after he passed away, and um, mostly just a lot of magazines and 
Life magazine and um, what was the other one? There was a few other ones. Uh, but I got to reading when I was in, in, in uh, uh, pretty early. I was, uh, uh, I had a really good uh, teacher, English teacher, and we wrote, we read uh, um, Travel to Charlie, you know, Steinbeck stuff, and I was always uh, uh, um, curious about words. Uh, when uh, when Dylan came out, well, actually, by when the Birds did Mr. Tambourine Man and and um, uh, My Back Pages and all these uh, songs, and uh, I realized that 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 lyrics could be uh, be more than than just um, you know the simplified romance or something like that. But but again, no, nothing like that because I grew up on Smokey Robinson, and man, that guy can write a lyric. Uh, so I was interested in that part of it, and I was interested in, in reading a lot of stuff. So uh, um, I went through the Beat Poet, uh, uh, Kerouac and Ginsberg and all that. I went through that period too, and uh, from from that led me to um, uh, uh, Japanese um, literature, Asian literature. Uh, Same Behind the Glass is written roughly in a renga, a haiku sort of way, because it has a repeat thing that goes on. And uh, it's not very specific to the 17 syllables, but uh, but those kind of things. And I still read, you know, uh, uh, stuff. What, what did I read last? I can't remember what I read last. Uh, I can't remember what I had for breakfast. God, oh, man, jeez. <laughs> the memory is the second thing to go, by the way. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, all over the all over the place. Um, uh, uh, Jumpa Lahiri, the, the, the uh, uh, writer and. Um, some ethnic writers, um, um, uh, Junok Diaz. You know, there's a lot of stuff I read. You know, of course, the classics like uh, like um, Marquez and and um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's kind of all over the place. Hi, Louis. Do Hi. either you or any of your bandmates have a Tia Berta or a grandmother or mother named Berta? Is that why you covered the Grateful Dead Berta? Because I think you guys did a really great job with that oh, song. Yeah. No, not I, I don't have anybody. Named, I don't, I'm trying to think. I don't think there's a Bertha. I think Bertha was because you know it was a great song by the Grateful Dead, and that's why we copied it. Okay, so that's just yeah. the only. I just was wondering if there was any story like why you chose that one out of all the Dead songs. No, I, I uh, to tell you the truth, the way it happened was that they were putting together a, a, um, a, um, a tribute record to the Grateful Dead, and uh, that seemed to be one that that wasn't chosen. And we kind of like the way it went, and, and there it is. You know, I get that yeah. accident. That's how we do everything. I actually like your version better than the Dead's one. But. Well, we were kind of rock it up a little bit. And thank you for yeah, thank you for saying perfect. that. But yeah. uh, no, there's no Bertha. I, I, my grandma was Kuka, and my my, my aunt was. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I had a great Jessie. aunt, Bertha. I'm Martha. I was named after your twin sister. Oh yeah, so really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just curious when uh, Steve Berlin came into the band. Mm. Was the chemistry like almost immediate? Uh, did he fit in right away? I understand he was with the Blasters, right? Yeah. Well, the way it happened, we started, we were playing in the in the uh, clubs in, in East Los Angeles. I know. I mean, in um, Hollywood, we had crossed the the river to go to Hollywood and play all these uh, punk rock clubs and confuse the heck out of everybody back home. You know, they couldn't figure out that whether the next time they saw saw me, I'd have a blue mohawk or something. But you know, but there was this whole thing that was going on with a kind of roots revival within the scene in, in Hollywood, and the Blasters were part of it. And um, um, Steve Berlin took notice of the band, and he came kind of sitting in, and then um, it complemented the band pretty good, because usually the, the typical Norteño band, Tex-Mex band, is accordion and saxophone. So it was a perfect thing. So we had to teach him how to play you know, the Mexican Norteños. So that's and, and he just kind of fit in and, and he just he's like the new guy and he's been with us for thirty five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to say oh, thank you, Louis, and thank you to Catalina. Oh, thank, thank you, you thank you, everybody. Wow.